Yeah, uh, retakes and salutations, all you beautiful individuals. We are back. It's League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you, beauties. And you might have heard a roar, a screech, something awakening from hibernation today. And it was probably T1 against the Guangdong Freaks. And let me, it didn't happen right away in this series for about a game and a half. You were sitting here saying, that's it. We're officially in the Guangdong era. You were certainly saying that throughout game one because at every turn, every objective, every fight, the Kwangdong Freaks found a way to hang toe-to-toe -to -toe with T1. T1 finds something. They get a kill. They get something. It's always answered by the Kwangdong Freaks until you get a little bit of a mistake, a little slip up in the Kwangdong Freaks. Find that opportunity to pounce, and I'm looking at your boy, Dudu on the Aatrox. Holy moly. He gets the nice matchup. I'll give him that credit against something like a Nar, where, yes, you still have that range, but I think right now I'm still favoring the Aatrox. Absolutely took that matchup and ran with it. How about it's just a treat to see no Cassante or Skarner in a top lane matchup. I never thought I'd be excited to see Nar Aatrox as a matchup. <laughs> That's the craziest thing about talking about it is it almost feels fresh. That's how wild things have been in the top side for how long we have been stale with Cassante and recently then just adding in Skarner, but more or less accomplishing the same type of goal, same type of annoyance to the viewership, getting something a little more traditional that does have a bit more back and forth, a little more excitement angles like the Nara and the Aatrox. Felt nice having that matchup, at least for this moment. So they were riding the full momentum after some clean team fighting for both Bulldog and Leaper as that dual carry threat and obviously due to clinching it on that Aatrox as you mentioned. Second game you see Baker lock in Aura. You say this is this is the patch. He can play his $500 skin. Riot's texting him, giving him phone calls. Play the skin, play the skin. Base skin Ari for the base faker because he has his whole career, guys. He's not even trying to make a statement. I, I don't even think he thought about it for a split no. second, to be honest. And that's just who faker is. That's how he's going to roll. And he rolls through on the default Ari skin. And he was rolling in this game, certainly showing why there is a $500 version of this champion because of the way that he plays it. Looked fantastic uh, out there on the rift. And I think the other guys on T1, certainly uh, more of a wake up call. Enough, you know, a pushback in this one from the Kwangdong Freaks that I don't think you'd say they just simply uh, got outclassed right away. But absolutely, this was T1 saying, okay, you want to go for a race? Let's see how we can race. And, you know, they got out to a quick start, but Kwangdong has a clean 4 0 team fight to kind of get the game back under control. But I've never seen two more polarizing back-to-back -back team fight skirmishes because they have that clean 4-0. They follow it up by trying to force something. They get a little bit caught out. Okay, the two carries are dead. That's that's okay. We can pull away. But no, three tanks. They decide to re-engage and go back in. And they have absolutely no business. They got no chance to kill anybody. It's, I mean, I respect them all going down together, but they all go down. I don't know what you're talking about, man. Don't you know the three most lethal champions in the game of League of Legends? Maokai, Nautilus, Cassante? Oh, they got that damn. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, absolutely mind boggling. Because you laid it out. You get the 4 0 earlier when you are at such a deficit before. It's good. You're going to get in a little bit more of a pushback, get that gold infusion in. You try your luck. And it was obviously that bit of a too much so far. That was a mistake. And you do pay the price of having both your carries go down. Your boys Bulldog and Leaper. And you decide to go full send at that point is such a bad call. I don't know who or how that type of decision came through. But even under the understanding of pure desperation, that's a rough one to make. The other maybe somewhat questionable call, CB Max pulling back the 2019 Griffin bot lane to Leah. He says, Faker T1, you remember this? And Faker says, yeah, I'm pretty sure I 3-0 did. <laughs> um, I'm to throw it completely in the trash like we did uh, a couple of years ago when we see these type of results. Uh, this was certainly not the moment. 
I think I will say very, very clearly was not one that matched up with what was happening for the rest of the match. And, and especially then how T1 was able to pressure from that point onwards outside of that one little mistake that does lead to that 404 uh, Kwang Dong in this matchup. And that momentum to close out game two fully carried into game three, a classic SKT best of because game three was all business across the board. You got to see Guma on a pick with some urgency in the Zeri. And not only that, Kyria and the boys, three tanky boys to play around that Zeri. Obviously the Corky as well uh, for Faker, the dual carry threat. But when Guma has space to operate, it turns out huh, he's still a world-class ADC. Oh man, never doubted it for one little bit. If there's been anything that we have seen with this year's iteration of T1, this T1 that we're sure or, you know, uh, kind of evaluating isn't going to reach the highs or the, the you know, uh, total domination that we thought you would reach as the world champion T1 heading on through into this next campaign. You see it in this one. It is Guma contributing, being that damage dealer, being someone you can trust at these moments. And one of the biggest things for me in this game three that we're seeing, not that we haven't seen to some degree before, but getting this type of sign and seeing this proficiency on it is something I like from T1 because I didn't think they had it before. The Zeri angle. That is one that throughout their dominance over this recent stretch, they have not necessarily captured that lightning in a bottle, the lightning girl, Miss Zeri, that every other ADC or every other dominant team has been able to find a way to exploit and really pressure with. This matchup, this game three from T1, the Guma performance on Zeri and the way that they supported, having that Zeri be that carry option, absolutely thought this was a good step forward for the team. And obviously both in games two and three, you saw Faker get a lead. Ari is a much more playmaking type of champion, but when he's ahead, that's when you see the snowball of T1 completely roll over the opposition. But that being said, 3-1 and one still for Kwangdong, the same record as T1, and they play a competitive series against this squad. I'm still feeling great about KDF as long as they stay away from bot lane to Leo. Stay away from bot lane to Leah and, and whatever the equation making process that was going in to engage with to, to keep the fight going with Cassante Malcolm. Uh, but at least they were all on the same page. It was the wrong page, but they were all yeah. on it oh, you together. Know, you know what? That does deserve at least one point for me. I'll give them that one for sure. But when you think about it for the Kwang Dong freaks, this should solidify that they are a legitimate option. For that last playoff tier in the in the LCK to be in that challenging zone, and that there still is a ceiling where okay, you know, sure we lose this series, you lose those next two games against T1, but absolutely things that you can go back to the drawing board, things that you go back and study and practice for in your scrims, and be better prepared and have a bigger challenge against T1 next time. That's what you got to be aiming for if you're the Kwang Dong Freaks. A rare thumbs up for both teams after a series. Doesn't happen very often in the LCK or any other region for that matter. Definitely not a double thumbs up for the latest installment of the Fraud Brawl. Weibo Gaming versus Ninjas in Pajamas and NIP slowly starting to shed all that fraud status and rookie dialing back the clock with a pair of double MVP for performance on a pair of AD carries to send Weibo even deeper into the depths of this group. What is this a fraud watch, fraud bowl, fake off type of situation in the LPL between NIP and Weibo Gaming? Well, unfortunately, wasn't really much of a competition because the competition that was played through clearly tells us that it is NIP that maybe is not deserving of being fully labeled with the Fraud Watch. I think there's some things to talk about. There's still a couple of, of shaky things that make you hesitant compared to the elite squads that we talk about at the very top of the LPL. But then you look at Weibo Gaming, and I think the verdict is in, at least for now. It's going to take a heck of a lot down in a loser bracket. You get that right, loser bracket type of situation. Because outside of this fearless draft early bit of the LPL, that is exactly where Weibo Gaming is going to find themselves. Yeah, you might be hesitant about NIP. Obviously, still some things to shore up. But you're giving them a passing grade these past couple of weeks. 
Weibo, I'm taking the report card and I'm dropping it in the shredder. Get rid of the evidence. Don't let anybody know because this current form, they go into the loser side of things at the Rumble stage. Uh, they're not beating these second, third, fourth best teams from some of these other groups. I'm being honest, I'm taking, I'm taking Weibo out of school. We're going to hit the gym. We're going to get a construction job because there ain't no way we're going through academics with that report card the way that they played through today. And it's so disappointing and frustrating when you see them play this type of way and look so dis, you know, dysfunctional as individual players and as that group. Because you know, at the very least, someone like Tarzan, he still got it. He still got it in the tank. But individually, he looks completely off. And as with the group, he looks completely off. And that group isn't also contributing the way that they should be type of things that we know is possible for Weibo. Because you don't have to look all that far back to find a Weibo gaming that did deliver on the name, on the hype and the power that you thought would there for this roster. A guy who was one of the most you know, iconic players on something like an Elise when he was in the LCK. I can't believe how much Tarzan is struggling on some of these AP carry junglers so far. He absolutely looks lost. It feels like we've fully gone back in time because it looks like Light is the only guy playing at a decent level looking around at the rest of his squad. Zhao, you're an MSI champion? Crisp, a world champion? You guys don't look like it right now. And the big problem for Weibo Gaming, again, it's been one of those things that you talked about last year. Yes, light can be an important and, and you know, should be an, uh, a valuable contributing factor for where you're getting your damage, where you're getting these fights to go your way and start winning games. But he can't be that leading tip of the spear. He can't be the only guy diving on in for that charge for this for the army it's got to be backed up he's got to have that support and right now no the shy you know uh Shao who is certainly not performing and lifting that type of weight that's not good enough and for someone like Shao who with that veteran status that he brings and the type of situations that he has weathered over the course of his career and shown that tenacity and skill to still get it done to not see it with this Weibo gaming squad so far that to me is, is the most damning nail in the coffin at the end of the day when we're looking about where this Weibo has performed. Despite the name power and brand that's on this Weibo squad, let's face it, they're just they're the, a middling tier kind of okay squad and my expectations for them making any kind of noise are completely gone for this year, which probably means they're going to win their next five series in a row and go, go all the way through winners. <laughs> You, you you watch the LPL, you, there's no question to you. You watch it, you watch Weibo play, you realize, man, nothing is going on here. Nothing right, nothing special, and you're seeing special. You're seeing elite-level plays from squads in the LPL. If you're paying attention and watching these other matches, on the outside looking in, you go, this is world's finalist Weibo. They've got, you know, oh, you know Tarzan, I, what, they got all these great players. What's going on? It's not that simple, and especially if you do pay attention, you do watch these games, and you watch the comparison to the rest of the LPL and the teams succeeding in the LPL, you won't so find any similarities with Weibo Gaming right now. So forget about Weibo. We'll pay attention to NIP as they continue to grow because, as we said, a vintage performance out of Rookie. He's not washed like the form that Zhao Hu and Crisp are in right now, so we'll continue to monitor them. But that is it today. For League Unlock, Eric and Mark here with you lovely individuals. As always, you have a fantastic day, and we will catch you on that flippity flip.